All right, so first let's just go over like, you know, traditional neural nets, right? So let's say that we are doing something like classifying MNIST, for example. So what we do is we would take our images, flatten them into like however many features, I think it's 784, 28 by 28 images, and then we would run them through some layers, like we'd have our hidden fully output, softmax, whatever. However, one thing that I want to stress when we look at images, you know, like let's say right now, we're all looking around, we don't just see our images as a linear collection of the pixels, for example, we group them into certain shapes like edges and whatnot, like on this screen, for example, you can see like the distinct edges, you can see what's more on the inside of the screen, and so on. So, one thing that we could potentially do is use that idea to, but we could use, leverage that idea to make better classifiers. But before I go into that, let's actually explain first what exactly a convolution is. And I'm going to explain this with an example. So let's say that we have some spaceship that we want to track over time. And we have this function x of t that you know, represents where the spaceship is at a time t. But we have a noisy sensor, and so uh, the position at time t by itself isn't going to be enough to really get us a good estimate. So we are going to want to average over all of the times up to and including the point that we are looking at. So we can do that by this integral formulation right here. So we have our position at time t is equal to the integral of this sensor layout times a weighting function. And the whole point of this weighting function is we're going to say, OK, the measurements that are more recent are more likely to be accurate, and the ones that are later are less likely to be so, so we're going to closer weight the ones over the closer. And, but the question is, what exactly is this weighting function exactly? How do we know exactly how to weight the ones that are closer? Before we get into that question, let's just determine what do we need for our function to be a valid weighting function? And uh, to do that, we first have we first realized that it has to be a valid PDF. So as you can see over here, you know, the indefinite integral from negative infinity to infinity um, of this function has to be one total area under the curve. Um, however, if but that's only true in this particular sort of example because we are looking, oh yeah, and it also has to be non-negative across the domain because you know when we look at time positions and whatnot, right, it can't be negative. So, uh, however, um, we can also apply this sort of approach of like using a weighting function to learn about other, to apply this to our problem. But first, one thing we have to do is like, let's say that we're looking at images and looking at certain regions of them and applying a weighting function. The first thing to actually note is when we do this in practice, you know, we don't do an in, we don't do an integral formulation like we were doing over here. Instead, what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to do a summation because our our data is discretized. So instead, we're going to go take the sum from negative infinity to infinity of this function applied at certain time steps, and essentially. Our goal is to learn exactly what this weighting function is. Uh, I'll get more into how we actually use this in a second, but I just want to go over like the sort of high level idea right now. Uh, so the way that we can then calculate a convolution uh, oh wait, actually one thing that I forgot to say here is that even though you can see how here it's like from negative infinity to infinity, but suppose that we we're calculating our convolution over an image of some fixed size, like, I don't know, this screen. 
for example, then one thing that we can also do is essentially just say that, okay, anything that exceeds the region of our image will go to zero. So, you know, it's not actually going to be some sort of infinite sum, which would be, you know, hard to calculate. We can make it something that fits within the region of what we're actually trying to do and thereby make it easier to calculate. So now let's look at a multi-dimensional example. So suppose that I have some sort of two by two image. Uh, what we're going to do is, you know, for any image, we can think of it as some sort of function i, where we take, you know, two points m and n, which you can think of as the particular height and width at that sort of point, and then we can get out some point, and then we have this kernel function, which tells us again, you know, how to weight this. And so uh, we can do the convolution in this way. And uh, we can extend this to an arbitrary number of dimensions. If we have, like, let's say, some sort of three-dimensional image, uh, then we can you know, do the same thing with height, length, height, and width. Um, so, now, I know I've been talking somewhat abstractly about this, so I kind of want to show you guys an example of what a convolution actually looks like. So here, let's say that we have our input image here and this kernel. So the way that we're going to calculate this convolution is we're essentially going to slide this kernel over the image. So if we look at this example here, we can see that we're sort of taking the kernel and applying it here, and we're doing, you know, a times w, b times x, e times y, and f times z. And then over here, we can see that we're sliding the kernel again, but this time we're going to take this portion and the kernel, and then we're going to get uh, this. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, actually, before we do this, you know, we would do this portion of the image with the kernel to get this, slide it over again, to get this, and so on and so forth. And so we can essentially think of that as, you know, taking, like, for the image, some portion of it. Like, let's say, you know, if we're looking at the this, like, big screen over here, if we take the some portion of it, we can use that as, as a feature in and of itself. And then that will help us better inform what exactly our classification will rely on. And you can actually see it with another example over here. So let's say that we have a curve over here, right? It can be represented by this kernel where the, you know, the... The regions of the kernel that have some sort of you know non-zero number are actually a part of this curve, and some and the regions which are zero, you know, aren't going to be a part of this curve. So we can visualize that over here. And we can see this curve can be used in certain Im in actual images. Like here we have this image of a cute little mouse. Uh, here we can see that that same curve. And let's see what happens when we convolve the filter with the relevant image. So if we if we take you know the image and the filter and do the same sort of convolution that I talked about a couple slides ago, then we see that we're going to get a uh, 6600, which is a large number. However, if we happen to take this curve and instead convolve it with like let's say this part that where it's like the head of the mouse, then we get a much smaller number, right? Because it wouldn't match. So can everyone start to see why convolutions are useful and how they are, in some sense, better than just taking all of your features and just stacking them together and putting them through? Does anyone have any questions about anything that I've said thus far? Yeah? Um, so in a normal situation, would you be training multiple kernels? Because in this case, it seems like this one specific kernel will only be able to connect the edge to the specific mesh. Yeah, exactly. In a uh, certain... When you're training convolutional nets in real life, you'd have multiple different kernels to detect multiple different kinds of features. I just have this one thing, you know, so you can see the whole point of what a kernel is and how it would work. 
We can have prayer. Yeah. Uh, you don't. That's a good question. You don't have to do that. You can adjust that, which is something that I'll be covering slightly later in this presentation. Okay, so let's proceed then. So I said that. So so another sort of advantage to convolutions is uh. So if we have very large images, then with fully connected nets, then that means that we're going to have a very large number of weights. Whereas with convolutions, we can have a much smaller number of weights. And you know, as you all know, a larger number of weights is going to lead to longer time for testing, training, and of course, overfitting, because it's a lot. So we don't want to do that. So that it. So that's called you know sparse interaction, and. You can sort of see that in this picture here, because if you look at all of, so let's say we have these two layers here, our X layer and our S layer. For, uh, for a net that has like a convolutional layer, you can see over here that for S3, the only few units that really affect it are X2, X3, and X4. Whereas in this bottom picture, you know, you see that if we were doing a traditional fully connected layer, then all of the inputs from X1 to X5 would impact it. So that's going to be a lot more weights, a lot more, a lot less generalization. And another thing that we can also look at actually is the receptive field. So here we see that for uh, now let's extend the image that we had to two to two layers. So we can see that even though from the second layer to the third layer, as I talked about before, only three hidden units happen to actually affect it. If we go back and look at the layer before it, we see that all of the all the nodes in our first layer happen to affect G3 over here. And that just goes to show how even though we can have a small, even though we have this reduced number of weights, we can still have this good receptive field, uh, which just you know happens to be which neurons, which input neurons affect a particular output neuron. So we can still take a lot of like input feature features and have them show up in different ways, but just uh, for fewer weights. Um, and, you know, in fully connected layers, all the parameters are separate, which is not the case for convolutional layers, as you can also see through this sort of picture here. And that also would make some sense, right? Because as I talked about before, when we're taking a kernel and applying it in different places, that has some parameter sharing effects. And another very important um, Example could be varying image sizes uh, because, you know, again, with a fully connected layer, it's like you have this particular, you just have to rely on, okay, you're taking this many things and shoving it in. Whereas with convolutions, we can actually control exactly what our output will be, even without having a fixed input size, which we will see shortly. So before I get into pooling, does anyone have any questions about some of the advantages of convolutions that I talked about? Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, do you mean that like for the parameter sharing, it's like the same parameters are like, repeated multiple times? So, like, uh, what I mean is, remember how I talked about taking the kernel and applying it in multiple different places? That's what I mean by parameter sharing? Yeah. So the design of a CNN that you presented has what people would call spatial invariance. Uh, could you also rotate or scale the filters to achieve rotation or scale invariance? Uh, I'm going to be talking about that shortly when I get to pooling. So another sort of operation that we can do is pooling, where essentially once we do a convolution, we can downsample it some more and basically just we can take particular regions of the image and provide various summary statistics. So we can see there are two different sorts of pooling. There's average pooling and max pooling. So here you can see with max pooling, right, we just take the max of each of these regions. Uh, whereas average pooling, we average 
across each of these regions. And, uh, you know, pooling has multiple different advantages. We can reduce the dimensionality of our input, which is always good. Uh, and we can make it invariant to small translations because, you know, even if we happen to translate it in one way, the summary statistic will take care of it. Does that help to answer your question? Yes. Cool. Uh, so small translations are ignored, and that can also help us, again, control exactly what our output will be, regardless of the initial size. And I want to actually show you an example of the translation invariance that I talked about above. So uh, say we have this image of a five here, and we note that we have three different sorts of translations of it. So when we're taking our kernel, working with it, and then we get different sorts of responses. Uh, you know, if we do max pooling, for example, right, then only the one that actually has the large response really matters. So here we can see in this picture on the left, the, um, it'll be the unit one that has the large response, whereas on the one on the right, it's the unit three that has the large response, but that doesn't really matter. It can pick it up regardless of orientation. So that's a very nice property that pooling provides for us. And now I'm going to get into some convolution variants aside from the vanilla formula. So does anyone have any questions on pooling? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Right. So you see how we have these three different sorts of units here that, that'll pick it up differently what, for different sorts of rotations with pooling. If we take the maximum, right, like even if some of the other ones that weren't training for that don't respond, then it doesn't matter because the max one will pick it up and we can interpret it correctly. Does that help? Cool. So, um, and the first thing that I want to go into here is padding. So one thing that I neglected to talk about before is, let's say we have a case where when we take our kernel, it's not able to, or actually, sorry, before I get into padding, I want to go into stride. So I'm sorry, I don't remember which of you asked the question, but I know one of you asked the question, do we always have to shift over by one when we're doing our convolution, and you know, the answer is no. It's very common for us to do something different, and we can specifically account for this by uh, shifting it over by a certain amount s, which is our stride. Um, and one thing that we can do often in conjunction with stride is, suppose we have a case where the kernel doesn't specifically fit into every, Let's say the kernel doesn't fit into every like, subregion of the image, uh, and we want to independently control the kernel size and the width output, then what we can do is we can essentially pad the images with zeros, so that then we can just continue to do our convolution as many times as we want, independent of what the initial input size is. Um, and this happens to be called a same convolution in either MATLAB or TensorFlow. Um, if we don't do this, then, th then it'll just be a valid convolution. And another thing that we can actually do is, so you know, how do we actually design these kernels in the first place? Because I was just like, oh hey, here are some kernels, and you know, we can backcrop into them over time as when training traditional neural networks, but what's a good way of initializing them? I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen before, when you initialize your weights differently when training a fully connected network, that could lead to some much better results. Um, so let's go over that approach with convolutional kernels. So, you know, one, one approach is simply random kernels, and, and, you know, the good ones will just be learned over time. And that actually works pretty well in many cases, but there are a couple other approaches that we can take as well. So, you know, I mentioned before in the slide with the mouse, we had a kernel that was specifically an edge detector. So rather than having kernels learn exactly what features to detect, especially the earlier ones, we could like specifically hard code them to detect certain kinds of features like edge detectors and whatnot. And I keep bringing up edge detectors a lot because as it turns out in many cases, 
in your first layer, in your first convolutional layer for a, for a network, many, many times the convolutions do end up being edge detectors because that's just one of the most common things that we tend to pick up first in an image. And another thing we can actually do is learn kernels in an unsupervised manner. So we could like, let's say, apply k-means clustering to a small image patch and use like certain centroids of that and just figure out from there what average features will be and use those as kernels. So before I get into this next part, does anyone have any questions about some of these convolutional variants that I've talked about? Yeah? Sure. So let's say again that like our kernel doesn't fit into every valid sub subregion of the image. There are a couple different approaches we can take. So one is to just limit ourselves to those regions and not have our kernel go all the way through the image. That's called a valid convolution. But another thing we can do is you know we can pad our image and add zeros such that the kernel size is then compatible with the image. And that's called a same convolution. And you know, again, that has advantages. We can like independently control exactly what our output size will be and what the kernel size is. Does that make more sense? Uh, so why would you not have like a valid subregion? Uh just if like let's say we have images of certain sizes which don't happen to like fit well with the size of the kernel, you know, it can't go through evenly each time. Does that make sense? Well, mo most likely it would just be smaller, but it just couldn't fit in evenly. It would be like, if you like looked at, like, I don't know, let's say the length of the kernel and like the length of the image, like it wouldn't be like mod zero, it would be something else, so you'd have some remainders, right? Oh, but like, every time you're moving the, the kernel, you're just moving it by one unit, right? Well, depends, right? Like I talked about over here, we have our stride, so we could move it by more than one. I see, so then like with your stride, you know, you have like uh, multiple times of stride and doesn't end up to be exact at the end. Yeah. Okay. Then, then you either have to have zeros or you just try to not get that situation. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Generally, yeah. So, to sort of go over what this would be like a lot of times, again, like as I said before, first layers tend to be uh, edge detectors, but then once you have like more layers, then the features that those layers tend to learn tend to be more higher level and specific things about the image. Uh, so if you have like, I don't know, let's say a picture of a dog, you know, you could have like certain features like maybe the shape of the teeth, the eyes, whatever, however, we might typically recognize dogs as we'd have, we'd be more high level like that the, the more layers in we are. Does that make sense? Yeah? Do we always use zero pad? Uh, usually when we pad, we do pad with zeros, yes. All right. So now I'm going to get into some convolution architectures because, you know, before I've just been telling you guys, okay, so this is what a convolution is but how exactly do we build, layer, build networks to design them? Because we usually when we have components of a neural net, we do put them together in specific sort of ways. So the first architecture that I want to tell you about comes from 2012, and this is the AlexNet architecture. Uh, I want to give a special mention to this architecture because this is one of the architectures that really got people excited about deep learning. Um, Image recognition was one of the tasks that really told people, oh, hey, these things have potential. We can really use these things. So um, with AlexNet, the way that it works is we have five convolutional layers followed by three fully connected layers. And um, to combat overfitting, we employ some dropout between each of the fully connected layers. And after each fully connected layer, the ReLU activation function is used. And you know, you can see here between some of these convolutions, you know, we use max pooling, as I talked about above. And a 
And then um, another architecture is called VGGNet, and this one improves upon AlexNet by replacing the large kernels that it had with size 11, which um, you can see over here in this picture, right, 11 by 11. It happens to go down, but uh, it replaces these with smaller, th with multiple smaller 3x3 three three kernels, and that's actually advantageous because we can then get a larger receptive field with more small kernels. So here you can see what this architecture is like. We have our image, then we do our convolution, go down, um, do max pooling, um, convolution plus ReLU, convolution plus ReLU, max pooling, more convolutions, max pooling, so on. And then finally, once we get to this end here, we do um, three fully connected layers with ReLU and finally a softmax. Now, another thing I want to talk about, which isn't the specific architecture itself, but we're going to use when we get to our next couple of architectures, actually, is a special thing called network and network. And essentially what that is, is before using, you, before using your fully connected layers, you instead have some one-by-one -one convolutions. Um, and you can use this to spatially combine features across multiple different feature maps. And now that brings us to our next architecture, which is called Inception. And essentially the way that Inception works is we build upon the neural network and network thing. And what we do is we can actually apply multiple different layers of convolutions in parallel. And we can use one by one convolutions to reduce the number of features before we're doing something expensive, like let's say a five by five or a three by three convolution. And that allows us to get more expressive power in parallel, which can be very helpful. And now the final architecture that I wanted to talk about was ResNet, and the way that this architecture happens to work is it takes the input of a convolution, concatenates it with the input two convolutions later, and this gives us some expressive power by allowing us to take our previous input and send it forward to help to help give more information, and uh, by, back, by bypassing two layers, we can make a smaller classifier, and this was also the first time a network of greater than 100 layers is trained, because, you know, there's often this saying in deep learning that, you know, just throw more layers at it, but obviously in a lot of cases, because of like, you know, hardware constraints and time constraints and whatnot, that's not always feasible, but this really helped us push the boundary in terms of how many layers we can really stack on to make an effective classifier. And that's all I have for you guys today. Do you have any more questions for me about, yeah? Um, strides are typically two, right? Uh, in many cases, yeah. Okay. And oh, sorry, sorry. You have another question. I have more. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can go down from that to you. Yeah. Okay. So with the um, ResNet block that you showed, mm -hmm. in the diagram there was um, a plus symbol. So is that representing a concatenation, or is mm -hmm. that representing a, a sum? Uh, it's a sum which we just represent as a concatenation. Uh, yeah. Um, could you go back to the Alex chat slide? Uh, could you just explain, kind of starting from like the way of what the blocks are is it in the context of like all the little pillars, uh, how the kernels are applying to this specific image? Because uh, I'm not exactly sure if like, you have any connection to it because I was given uh, a little bit. Okay, so I don't remember exactly how many kernels there are, but I can explain it just in terms of for the particular kernel that they show here exactly what's happening. So we start with this image, which is 224 by 224 by 3, and so it's an RGB image. Then we do 11 by 11 convolutions with a stride of 4, and that will now bring us down to a 55 by 55 by 96 image. And then from there, we do a 5 by 5 convolution. Uh, 
with not fooling. And then we get, and then that'll actually get us to a 256 by 27 by 27 image. And then we do a three by three convolution. This will take us to a 384 by 13 by 13. And then we do another, a three by three convolution. And then we get 13 by 13 by 384. And then um, another three by three convolution, 256 by 13 by 13. And then we, uh, yeah. So are those numbers like 96, 256, 384, are all those just like random or do you get to pick them somehow? Uh, you can pick them by basically controlling them like how many kernels you have and whatnot. They're the number of filters for the previous layer, right? Mm -hmm. What determines the dimensionality of the rest of the input value? Like the 13 by 13? Uh, that's, yeah, that's something that you can then control. Uh, I don't know exactly what the parameters were that they chose, but, I'm, but given what they were, this is what it comes out to be usually. Yeah. Um, for the inception layer, um, what is the, can you just go over the logic behind going from that uh, to forward, like the different layers that all get combined back into the one layer? So the logic behind that is it allows us to do multiple different types of convolutions to get different types of features on and doing it in parallel. And again, with the network and network, we we kind of reduce that down to make it not as expensive because otherwise if we're doing five by five and three by three convolutions in parallel, that could be very expensive time-wise. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what's the logic behind the one by one convolution? Just... Again, that, that's the network and network thing to just reduce our feature space. Okay. Uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, so I really just want to take it back to, to Alex's next slide. Mm -hmm. Mm. Again, I'm pretty sure that that's just because of the fact that we chose, we can actually choose to, in certain dimensions, upsample our convolution rather than downsampling it, so we can um, increase it actually. Convolutions don't necessarily have to decrease the number of features. Yeah? So to provide a further explanation, each of the filters that you're using in each of these convolutional layers is, for example, the first layer is 11 by 11 and then it has a depth of three. Okay. This the filter extends through every channel of the image. And the reason why it maps to a depth of 96 in your next layer is because you have 96 of these 11 by 11 by three filters. And then you can evolve each filter with your input image and then you can catenate the output of each of those 96 filters into that new volume. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then, if that, like, um, that kind of is going off that, so if you keep doing that and we get to the last one that's 13 by 30 by 258, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 like, then you max pull, is it you max pull over each, I guess, filter? So then why doesn't the next one have the same, like, uh, two, two, I mentioned 258, how can you pull down to 96? Mm hmm. Uh, I guess that's because when we do our dinosaur, we set it to output that, you know. <coughs> a dense layer, that's like, you know, a fully connected layer, right? Oh, okay. So, like, it, 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 like you have to, you, 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 like, connect every single thing in that cube to a dense mm -hmm. So then you're already considering all the possible, uh, I guess, features on all the possible like filters that are going to Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? All right. Well, if not, then that's all I have for you guys today.